is that we simply are inviting you are now uh, unmuted folks that are members of the SOS program to some educational webinars and because SOS is brand new like literally only 2 months old uh, we are you are now muted together what is going to be helpful as we go and one of the things i've always envisioned having was going to be some educational webinars 45 minutes long uh, maybe not always on a friday before a long weekend but something that is going to be helpful for the members, but also is picking up from trends that we're seeing. And so, of course, as I imagine, as you can imagine, uh, there is, um, uh, uh, you know, blogging is the key thing that we want to talk about first off. Future topics, you can send me ideas on future topics, but some of the ones that uh, Gene, for example, has suggested is on how to collect and use images. Um, we can also start looking at headlines more specifically. We can look at all sorts of things around promotion. But the idea is that we're going to start off with this first one, see how it goes. It's going to be recorded. Uh, we'll start to create an archive where people can go in and look at these uh, so that it's a really uh, quick and fast way for them to get some uh, new ideas in terms of how to improve the quality of um, their blog, but also how to maximize the value they're getting from SOS. So, we're using Meeting Burner, which is a uh, online tool that we've been using for two years now to do all of our webinars. In the top left-hand corner is a Q&A box. So if you haven't done so, if you go up there and type something in like Good Morning to the Q&A box, that way I know that you see it and it's working. That's how we're going to communicate through uh, this webinar. I'm going to also open the phone lines later on for some Q&A. But to get started, if you just go and type something in the Q&A, um, that uh, lets me know that you're hearing me and that you know how that works. All right, there's Charlie, and um, let's see if we got, and hopefully Peter is on, and Gene's already communicated, and there's Peter. That's great. And so, also just to give people an update on where we're at with SOS, I mean, this is a very small, unique, uh, so I guess we're at the boutique level uh, startup, and it's really exciting to see it's growth. Like we are this week going to be just at about 20 members and we signed on four more this week. Um, and as it grows, we're going to become you know, more sophisticated and also offer more and more services to you. Already I think we've probably gone through 12 iterations since the inception of it. And we're also, what's really exciting is we're seeing amazing results. So Sarah, who works with me in the office, has been watching once every month to see what the results are uh, from Google Analytics in terms of each member's um, website. And we're seeing 10 to 15 percent increase in traffic. We're seeing a reduction in bounce rates. That's the number of people that leave your site after only one page from as much as as high as 100 percent bounce rate, which is the worst possible. That means they came in, they left, down to like 70 percent within one month. So we're seeing really impressive. I mean, there's, there's the other metrics as well, number of followers, all those sorts of things. But what we're mostly interested in is traffic to your website. And we're seeing amazing results. And I'll talk more about that at the end of this program, how you can, um, how you can help support SOS, but also how you can um, earn a um, free month with SOS. Okay, so here's what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to give you a, uh, kind of an overview of some of the things that I've learned, particularly in the last three years, about creating a successful blog. So I want to talk, uh, first of all, about why we have a blog, just to reinforce what we're, why this is an important piece of your work, some of the main goals for having a blog. Um, also, I want to walk you through the process that I use to create a blog so that you can create them in a really fast and efficient way. Then I'm going to talk about uh, different tricks that you can use to make them really readable. And then at the end I'm going to share with you some really amazing statistics that just came out this week uh, about blog headlines. And then we're going to finish up with images. Just a little bit on images, even though that really deserves an entire webinar in its own right. Uh, but I want to just give you kind of a heads up on the way that I use images and get, show you some examples from my recent blogs just because uh, you're all going to be blogging in the interim, and I don't want you to be waiting until we do a webinar on that. 
Uh, I have seen an amazing increase in my blog traffic since I started seriously blogging. I think I've been seriously going at my blog for three years. And I went through those horrible initial months where nothing happened. No traffic, no response, no comments. And now we're seeing as many as um, you know, 40 comments on blogs. Now of course you have to admit half of those are mine. But that's you know, 20 people commenting on a blog and over 110 social shares on a blog. It's not unusual now for me to get 40 to 50 social shares on a blog. And it's only going up every month. And what's, what I'm seeing as a result is the traffic is, in parallel, is increasing in parallel. So you know, we're, we're now at the point where we're uh, quite comfortably getting two to 400 uh, unique user, visitors a day. And that uh, we're getting opt-ins in the order of 30 to 60 a day. So that's unbelievable. So 30 to 60 opt-ins a day is, is what I'm mostly interested in because those opt-ins get into my email list. And then from my email list, I can actually stay in touch with them in their inbox and I can market to them. And it all starts with my blog. So let's talk a little bit about why blogs are so important. So hopefully you can see my slides as I go through them. Uh, first of all, blogs are a great way to develop a personal brand. So it's you talking about what you think is most important. And it's a great way to do it because it's, it's, it's you communicating hopefully once a week about what's important to you. So people, without you having to promote it, you are in effect telling them, this is what I think is important in my industry, in my work, and what I see with my clients. It's a really uh, convenient way for people to share your information, maybe even make it go viral. So blogs, whether people are using an RSS a reader, for example, Feedly is the one that I use. Feed, F-E-E-D-L-Y dot com is a really simple, uh, elegant uh, reader that allows me to scan blogs really quickly. Uh, whether they're using a tool like that or they simply come to your blog and they hit one of the social media buttons or they copy your URL and drop it into Twitter, it's very easy for people to share your content. So that's why blogs are um, a great way for you to get your word out there. It helps to define your platform. What I mean by that is that you can uh, very effectively start to nurture and hone in on what it is you want people to buy from you. Like what is it that you think is important if you do your job correctly. Uh, it's great. For, you can bring in guest bloggers. The advantage there is not only do you get you know, a little bit of um, a relief in terms of your work, but because they wrote the blog, they are going to want to promote it. So um, Noah, uh, Noah K um, uh, Kagan is a great example of this at OK Dork, where he has these amazing, um, extensive, well-researched blogs that the author then goes and promotes the heck out of it. Social Media Examiner is an, an amazing example of that. Uh, they are probably one of the biggest, well, they certainly are the biggest website in the world to do dealing with social media specifically, but they're one of the smartest in terms of how they use guest bloggers. Uh, you can also interview people for the same purpose. You can experiment with different topics. Uh, over the last six months, I have tried topics on income uh, or money. I've tried topics on exercise. Uh, topics on clutter, topics on productivity, topics on procrastination. And what happens is very quickly I can start to get a sense of what people find is um, valuable and important. It's very different than Facebook or Twitter because there's a permanence to your blog. In other words, it's archived. People can go back and read past, uh, um, past episodes. And so they can start to, just based on their traffic, you can start to get a very good sense of what is actually trending. So for example, for me, I am seeing money and exercise as jumping out as being the most read blogs on my site. And what's interesting is that some of those blogs are from April. So they're like four months old, and yet they are still trending as being week over week uh, the most popular blogs. Well, that tells me that I need to write more of that content as long as it's congruent with what is my value proposition. In other words, you know, I'm not going to write about food even though they may have picked up on something about food or diet in my blog because it's not what I teach. It's not what I speak about. So I'm going to look at things that are congruent. And my, 
you know, my main focus is productivity and lifestyle. So exercise and money makes sense. Um, and finally, you get immediate feedback. So whether it's from comments or social shares, but you, or even your Google Analytics, you get immediate feedback. So it, it's a very unique tool if used properly. Uh, it's very well accepted as a medium for people to learn from. Many people subscribe to blogs. Many people will become uh, rabid fans of blogs because they find that it is a great way for them to save time. They don't have to search the web. They go to certain people week over week and they will read that blog. All right, so let's go into what are your goals with your blog. And if you've got any questions as I go through this, please jump in with the Q&A and, um, and just ask a question and I'll try and respond. Yeah, Jean just said, I learned a lot from Social Media Examiner. Actually, just on that point, thanks for that, Jean. Social Media Examiner, Mike Stelzner is the founder of this uh, website, uh, is an amazing resource. You simply go to Social Media Examiner, go to their um, search tool, which is right on the website, type in a word, type in Twitter, headlines, viral, images, and um, it is one of the best resources for very quick summations of best practices. So if you want to know how to best use images in your blog, just go to Social Media Examiner and use that keyword search tool. It's, it, it really, you know, um, it, it's so well curated. Uh, Mike Stolzner has repeatedly said that he has a team of nine people and every blog goes through each person's hands. In other words, nine people touch every blog. So even though it's written by a guest author, his entire team will fact check, image add, check the links, uh, check the grammar. So you can be guaranteed, even though he's putting out one blog per day, that they're of extremely high quality. Okay, so let's look at your goals. I believe that there's only really a couple of goals for a blog. So the first is to attract attention. I mean, after all, we're all in business here. We all like money. We've got to pay bills. So it's to attract attention. That's what the blog is for. Secondly, it's to engage the reader. Not purely because I want to entertain them or I want to keep them on the blog. It's because I want to keep them on my site. The longer they're on my site, the better chance I have that they're going to opt into my newsletter or opt into my mailing list or look at my products and services. So the blog's purpose is to attract the you know, bees to the honey, if you want to use that metaphor, but also to keep them there on the site. Thirdly, it's to, it's to start to get them thinking about buying from you. So lots of people, I mean, every day I'm having these amazing conversations. I had six yesterday, I'm oh, sorry, five yesterday, um, of people that are interested in the SOS program. And one of the questions that's most commonly asked is, will it make me money? And I'm kind of stunned by that question nowadays, but I have to really, it makes me really think. And what I usually say to people is, you know, the old way of making money was to go out there and just sell stuff. It's kind of like the way car sales people still do it and appliance people do it, and that's appropriate for their industry. But when you're selling intellectual content like we are, or you're selling something that requires people to, um, that requires people to, um, to, to, to really start to, um, under, they need to understand how you work and what your services are, there's no better way than a website because a website provides them with static content that they can go through, whether it's static in terms of a video or it's in terms of a questionnaire, it's in terms of descriptions or product descriptions. And so uh, your blog is the heart of it because the blog is this, is this like column or it's this, it's this um, uh, currently updated opinion or how-tos that you are providing that keeps them on the site. Okay, next goal is, um, so we've got three goals is to attract, engage, and buy. And then the overall goals in terms of marketing and content marketing, as you know, is we want to get people to trust us. So how do they do that? Well, they come on a regular basis. They like what they see, but they also like the way that we explain things and project. project. Trust also, by the way, is engendered by doing things consistently. If I come to your blog and I really enjoy it, but the next time I go there's nothing new, then it, it's not that I don't trust you, but I don't trust your site. Because 
essentially I'm expecting that because that's how blogs work is that they're regularly updated just like a newspaper column. I mean, it would be pretty weird to go to Huffington Post and see that there's nothing new since June. So you also build trust by doing things consistently and delivering on that promise. Um, it also, the blog helps to build you up as an authority. What I mean by that is an expert in your field. You can put in normal advertising copy on your website like all of you do, your bio, your product description, your services description. But there's a funny thing about that. You see, we all understand that that's advertising. Just like when I look at an advertisement in the newspaper or, or online and it says, this is the best, the greatest. Well, we all know that that's coming from the point of view of the person that's trying to make money. But a blog is different. A blog is not so much about making money. A blog is about sharing helpful advice, about sharing opinions. And so we are going to trust that blog. We're going to read it, and as we read it, we're going to see you as being an authority. Um, number three is we want them to like you. We like your style, uh, like your approach, like your insights. And finally, we want them to get to know you. And you do that by also including some personal insights, personal um, experiences, uh, client stories, talk about how you overcame things. And so that little acronym spells TALK. Because when they are satisfied that they trust you, they see you as an authority, they like you and they know you, they're going to talk about you. And that's how blogs really serve you well, is that people will then share it on social media and they'll even share it um, as, uh, when they're like, you know, speaking in front of audiences or they're writing their own blog. So a blog is not just simply this you know, thing that you have to do. A blog is an active form of marketing that probably, in my opinion, you know, and, and video is a close second, but more than anything else, is going to engender a, um, a selective, pre-qualified audience to your list. So that's my argument for why you should be blogging. And uh, so let's look at now, um, Let's look at what kind of, um, or the, the process, excuse me, the process that I go through to create a blog. So one of the things that I've noticed with the SOS members so far is that there's often big gaps between blog postings. And again, that is going to impact how people trust you and perceive you. It's kind of like saying, you know, hire me, I do a great job, and I keep my promises, oh, except um, when it comes to my blog. And so if you're going to launch a blog, Michael Hyatt talks about this a lot in his book, Platform, but if you're going to launch a blog, it's like saying, I've got a regular newspaper column, and you can rely on it for valuable insights that you can actually use. You don't necessarily you know, need to read all of them, uh, you may not even find all of them valuable, but you can rely on me. And when I go to a blog site and I see dates on um, what are quote the current blogs that are two months old, right away what happens is I distrust everything else on that website. Because if that blog is that old, what it suggests to me is other information, other promises are also dated. So. Why would I respond to product listings or invitations if there's already dated information on the blog? Okay, so here's how I go through my blog writing process to make it really efficient so I can turn one out every week. So first of all, I always ask myself, well, who is my avatar? And by now, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this concept of an avatar or your ideal client. And it's kind of a funny notion, but it's very effective when it comes to writing content. The idea is that you don't think about everybody you want to serve. You think about your ideal client that you want to serve. And so who is it? How old are they? What gender are they? What income level? What experiences have they been through? So it's really demographic and psychographic blended together. So who is that ideal person? So for me, when I'm writing my blog, I'm primarily thinking about middle management, probably working in a large firm, maybe even in a national firm, uh, who spends a lot of time at their desk. They've probably got two or three kids at home who are still in school. 
Um, he's, he or she is probably in their 40s to 50s, mid-income level. So I've got all these different criteria that I think about, and I can actually picture a you know, typical person that I would have seen in my audience, and that's who I write to. Now, of course, there's people that are older, there's people younger, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't matter. When I write to one avatar, what happens is, um, is I become a better writer, and more people will um, hear themselves in my blog. It's, 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 it's analogous to standing on a stage and looking at one person at a time in the audience. If you simply scan the audience, nobody feels like you've looked at them. But if you look at one person at a time and then move to the next person, the funny thing is that everybody feels like you're looking at them. So that's why we pick an avatar first. Second is, of course, I look at my topic. Now, I get my topics from all sorts of sources, but I generally use Evernote, um, which is a free online tool, to keep track of possible topics. So what are topics that come up? And usually it's, you know, it's, sort of things that have happened during the day that will prompt an idea. So it's something that someone said to me. It's um, a panic moment in my week. I felt overwhelmed. I, you know, I, uh, my list was too long, and at the end of the day I felt defeated. Like what is it that happened? And then I will go into Evernote, and I just will add that as a possible next topic. Then the next thing I do is an outline. And uh, I used to use a mind mapping software and I don't do that anymore. I find it just it's it's slower than I want it to be. I do use mind mapping software all the time for creating new courses and speeches. So I always use it for that. That's a very good use of my time. But for a blog, because I'm doing them so frequently, I'll tend to just either uh, write it out in a journal, uh, or I'll just scribble down some notes like on the computer. So I, I'll open up. Um, the software, I, I, I'm on a Mac, so I prefer using Pages. I find it's nice and clean, cleaner than Word, doesn't have all the little buttons. And so I'll just start in Pages, and I'll, I'll, I might even just start with headlines and just try to get myself organized that way. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the first draft. And I like to do my first draft uh, at night, uh, just before I go to bed. So I might, um, I might, uh, you know, just like even though it's going to be garbage, quite frankly, I'll spend maybe 20 minutes before I go to bed, and I'll just quickly type up what I think is the first draft. Um, Charlie just asked a question about mind mapping. I I used uh, I used to use MindJet, and now I use MindMeister. A uh, MindMeister, I think it's M-E-I-S-T-E-R from Germany. MindMeister, and uh, it's, it's an online tool as opposed to MindJet, which was downloaded software. And so I like MindMeister because it's, um, it's better for traveling. It's stored automatically as I'm working on it. I don't actually have to hit Save, which I really like. I love those kind of – it's like with Evernote. You never have to hit Save. So for a guy like me, that's really a good thing. So I use MindMeister. Um, so I, I create that first draft. Um, Anne Lamont, she's my language, but Anne Lamont, who's a, a wonderful author from California, she calls this your shitty first draft, because that's really what it is. Then what I'm going to do is, when I'm fresh, is I'm going to sit down and edit it. And I always do this in two sittings. The draft is first. It's really crummy, but it gives me a bit of a format. It gets me thinking about it. Maybe I'm going to sleep on it. And then first thing in the morning, and my morning club window is when I do all of the blog writing from 5 till 7 every morning. That's when I finish the um, the draft the the copy and my goal is to finish that in one sitting. So I may tweak it later. I may change the grammar. Like constantly as I go through my blog, I'll I'll I'll, I'll notice grammatical errors, and I just you know I just go in there and just change it on the fly. It's no big deal. But I want to get that blog done in two sittings: the draft first, maybe 20 30 minutes, and then the, the final sitting could take me as long as two hours. My goal is to do it in one hour, but usually. I'm pretty finicky, so I, I, I um, will spend up to two hours. But my goal is then I'm done. I've actually completed that, and the image is done as well at the same time, which I'll talk about later. So then I go and grab my image. That's the last thing I do. It's really important that's last because it's kind of a fun thing to do, and I can get distracted doing it. And also, I want to make sure the image represents the blog, so it makes sense the blog is done first. And then finally, I post it. And 
Um, we're kind of back and forth on the posting right now. So I had one person posting it for me, and now because we just launched a brand new website at hughcolver.com, I'm posting it now, but we are going to be moving over to someone else posting it um, as soon as we find someone. Because there's about 10 different steps that we documented that need to be done every time you post a blog. But that's it. So once I go through that entire process, I should be done in about uh, and at the most two and a half hours. So that's two and a half hours out of my week that are producing probably you know, some of the most important work that I do all week because that blog, remember, is going to be there forever. It's a part of my archive. It's, a, it's what I can link to from other blogs. It's a part of what visitors can go to and get valuable information from. So it's not a throwaway by any means. This is really important. And with the SOS program that you've enrolled into, it's what we pick up on. It's what we look at every week. And then we will capitalize on that blog, and we will get you noticed. But we need that blog to look at. All right. Okay, so let's jump into now. What I want to look at next is topics. And then I want to look at some style, um, style features. But before we move on to topics, let's just go back and look at this list again. So what is it that already you're thinking you may need to change in terms of your process for producing a blog on a regular basis? So if you can go up into the Q&A box right now please, just tell me what do you think you need to change to become more efficient with getting your blogs created every week? So Peter says, uh, uh, scheduling time to write the blog, that's a really important one. And I, Again, for me it's, it has to be the morning, but for whatever works for you when you feel the most creative and you feel the least distracted. Jean says, I need more examples and tips about call to action. Oh good, we're going to talk about that. I always stall on that one. Uh, that's a really good one. Uh, so Jean says, I keep a do thing file folder with me that is my hard copy of events and cal campaign calendar. I have plastic pages of my re recipes of how to write blog speeches, sales copy, great examples. Good. So it's like a, it sounds kind of like a swap file where you've just got these great ideas. I love that. So uh, the first thing I would really recommend for all of you is keep a, have a place, I, again I use Evernote, but have a place where you can easily capture ideas. Because if you're at all like me, well first of all, you know, sorry about that, uh, but if you're at all like me, ideas come and go so quickly, I, I forget them. So you know, maybe I'm with a client or I just get off a phone call or it's 2.30 in the afternoon and I'm feeling exhausted. Well there may be a blog topic there that relates to my focus area. But in your case, it may be that you're just simply reading something online and you think, oh that's a really good article. Great. So capture that URL, go into Evernote, and just type a couple of sentences about that, and that's one topic ready to go now. And so when you're ready to start writing, that's what you need to tap into. Okay, so let's look at um, what kind of topics could you uh, write about. Well, first of all, personal stories. So right now I am getting the best response to my blogs that are about me personally as opposed to about my clients or about my work or opinion blogs about, my, um, about my, the nature of my work. So personal stories. So people seem to be responding uh, to my stories. Now I'm not recommending that that's the only way to go, but I am suggesting that when it comes to reading valuable advice on the web, I do think in general people like to hear what the author is experiencing, like what the author is going through. Um, even if you go to like, you know, sites like Huffington Post, which are more of an aggregate site, you'll see that a lot of the authors will share their personal story. You know, it doesn't matter if they're a CEO or a professor or they're a consultant. The personal stories, we love that stuff. You know, when people start to describe what you've been through, right away we start to create an image in our mind we start to actually find real um, emotional content in, in the words. And it's just it's, it's an interesting shareable topic. 
Secondly, you can use a client story. So I will often write about stuff that a client said to me or you know, an email that I received from a client that changed my thinking about the work or I'll write about workload, that sort of stuff. Uh, third, you can, how to's are really um, popular. Uh, in this webinar, I will share with you some headline statistics which will explain more about how to do how to's. Uh, book reviews, interviews, you can comment on the news, you can provide a list of resources. Lists are hugely popular. A ninja hack. So what I mean by that is like a, a clever way to do something that's kind of complicated. So a clever way to use software, a clever way to work with clients, a clever way to work with your customers, um, an opinion that you've got on a topic, or a guide to a popular talk, topic. What I mean by a guide is like an infographic, or a, um, a, um, for example, a checklist, or a step-by-step -step guide where you've looked at a problem that your clients often have and now you've summarized it for them in a step-by-step -step guide. And that's very valuable. People love that. Anything that simplifies something complicated is very shareable. It's very valuable for people. Uh, I would suggest, and Mike Stelzner actually talked about this recently, is again from Social Media Examiner, is that there's too many opinion blogs out there. Uh, he says what people really are hungry for is how-to blogs. Okay, so now let's look at my template. And um, some of you may have seen this before because I, I have shared it in different ways before. But this template is, in my mind, was a complete game changer for me because I can use this template for blogs, speeches, webinars, articles, like virtually uh, sales calls, anything where I want to explain a solution, I can use this template. So this is how the template works. And again, imagine I'm writing my first draft of my blog. I've got maybe 30 minutes, and I want to get my thoughts in order. The first thing I do is I describe the problem. Now, of course, I might introduce the blog with a, a question or some provocative sentence, but essentially what I want to do is I want to introduce the problem. When I stand on stage, this is how I start the speech. I might start with a, a story or a clever, you know, a funny anecdote, but I, I go right away into the problem that I've come to address. You need to let people know what this is about. It's boring to say, I'd like to write about blah, blah, blah. It's more interesting to say, have you ever experienced this? Or this is a problem I see my clients having. Next what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my story. Now what I mean by that is I am going to share why I am qualified to write about this. But the way I'm going to prove my qualification is I'm going to share how either I've, been, uh, I've had this problem or I've had a client that's had this problem or, and this is a distant third option, there are statistics that prove that this is quite a big problem. The best segue here between problem and solution is, I've been there too. That's the best segue. Second best segue is, I've worked with clients that have been there too, or as well. And third best is, there's lots of facts to support that this is a big problem. And that's more of a newspaper type style hey, there's a problem that's happening out there. Here's some statistics to prove this is really a problem. And then we move into solution. And what I mean by solution at this point is a high-level context creating solution. So it doesn't serve people to go from problem to story to bullet points. What you do is a segue. And the segue would sound something like this. There is a better way to deal with this, but it has to do with getting your team on board, let me explain, or something like that. So I'm providing a bit of a context before I jump into the solution. It's just like a salesperson would do. They say, okay, I understand what your needs are. I understand that's a problem. I think that I have a solution for you. I'm, you know, and this solution is gonna, it's gonna cost you some money, but it is gonna really help you out. So they're gonna do a segue. And then I jump into, okay, well, here's my solution. And the solution in a blog, a really safe solution is three bullet points, five steps, six ways. That's always safe. It always works. 
And in, in many ways, it's more shareable if you do bullet or number your solution because it's easy and quick for people to read. Um, and when, they see, when people see a visual list, they're more likely to want to read it. When they see more text copy, they're less likely to want to read it. It looks like more work. So I provide the solution. Then I might provide do's and don'ts. What I mean by that is how to apply it. So I might say, you know, make sure you want to include this person, or make sure that you, know, you map this out ahead of time, or make sure that you have clear timelines, or here's a couple of considerations that you may want to research before you start. And then I wrap it up by saying, here's how to get started. Okay, so that's, that's the template. And back to Jean's question about, or comment about call to action. That next steps is where I'm going to have a call to action as well, because in next steps is where I'm going to invite them to talk to me. So for example, I really want to hear what your ideas are. Write in the comments below what you're planning on doing. Or does this sound like a problem that you've got as well? Tell me about the problem. Or so, uh, you know, does this work for? Do you think this is going to work for you? If so, how will you apply it? And so I try to always ask them to respond in the comments below. And, it, and it's, it's, really, um, it's really working uh, for me. People need to be asked. They will not think about it. Like kind of a funny thing with my blog is that even to this still, is people are more likely to email us and thank us for the blog uh, than to write. So we're trying to train people to actually write in the comments because obviously that's really good for social sharing and for optics. Gene, you had a question about thoughts about inviting guest bloggers. Uh, I'm encouraging my JV partners to guest blog. Well, I'm, I haven't done a guest blog yet. I'm, I'm excited about getting, starting to invite people to do guest blogs. Uh, I think they're terrific. I think they should be done sparingly because I actually am a strong believer that the blog should represent you. After all, uh, for pretty well I think everybody on this call uh, people are hiring you. Now you may have team members and you may have support crew, but essentially it's you that they're hiring and the blog should be primarily coming from you. Um, but I think sparingly guest blogging is really good. I know you can go to people like um, Pete Williams, for example. <clears throat> if, if you want to see a, a very extensive um, invitation package, go to Pete Williams' site. I can't remember his name of his website, but he's in Australia. He's pretty popular. So that's Pete, P-E-T-E -E, Williams. And um, go, just go look for guest bloggers and click on it and you'll see this whole list of requirements that he puts out for people that are interested in guest blogging. And you might want to pick p bits and pieces of that. Uh, and so essentially what he's doing is he's trying to automate the, um, the application process. So you can have a look at that. Okay. So, um, Okay, question for you before we uh, go to this last step. So what is it about this template uh, that um, you could use? So in other words, what's, what, is it, what part are you not doing that I've just shown you in this template that you should be doing in your blog? So just give me a quick little um, comment there in the Q&A if you could. So what is it in this template that you can use? You're not using it yet, but you could use. Okay, so Gene says, call to action. I'm nervous about comments on blogs. Assumes you do something with submitted. Yeah, what do you do? So comments on blog are, um, I think, are an excellent way for you to be in communication with people. And I, as quick as I can, will respond to comments on blogs. So we use a tool called, a free tool called Discus. And uh, Discus, I think it's D-I-Q-C-U-S. And Discus is a really, helpful tool because it sends me an email to let me know someone's commented and I can jump over there and I can respond back. And uh, we've got some blogs now with there's like 42 comments on them. And I think it's a really great way to engender communication with people. Um, you're only going to get a small percentage that will comment, but I think, it, I think it's super valuable to, to try and get that. And that's why I always invite it. Um, Charlie says, my story, I've been there too. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's a really, and Charlie, it's a really neat way to write because right away you're putting yourself personally into the blog. And I think that, you know, 
that's what people are looking for nowadays. Like it's great that people have opinions and strategies, but essentially we want to know what does this person actually think? Like this person that we've come to like and know and podcasts like Charlie's podcast, which is an excellent podcast, the baby boomer owner, business owner is, um, is all about Charlie, right? It's all about Charlie talking and Charlie's ideas and Charlie's thoughts. And I think that the blog should reflect the same sentiments as well. Peter says, not using personal stories yet, call to actions are weak. Yeah, so both of those would be great. And Peter also, it's, it's totally appropriate to use client stories, you know, so an experience you've had in client. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. I want to get into some blog style tips and then talk about images. So just really quickly, and, and this, this probably in many ways deserves an entire webinar on its own, which I may do, um, but here's a couple of thoughts on style tips. Uh, five things. Make your sentences short. Make your paragraph short. Remove unnecessary words. Use simple words and use internal links. Now, so I'm going to go through a couple of these in more detail, and we'll talk about these you know, all in um, more at length here. But let's just go through um, uh, a couple of these in detail. So um, short sentences. This is an example from my last blog. So there's three sentences here. When I'm traveling to speak at conferences, my morning is when I do my final preparation. That's precious time I need for last minute changes and to rehearse. So there isn't a lot of time for pleasures like getting some exercise in. Well, that last sentence to me, that might be how I write that in the draft, but if I'm doing my final edit sounded like this. So time is limited for exercise. So that's what I mean by short sentences. That whole last sentence has 14 words in it, but I added it down to 6 words. So time is limited for exercise. And in a blog, this is really important because first of all, from an optics perspective, the longer the blog looks, the longer the paragraphs, the less likely people want to take the time to read it. But secondly, if you can get them to read faster, they're encouraged to read more. Um, here's another example of short sentences. There's no shortage of advice on leadership. Hi, uh, that's an M dash, by the way. Most don't work. It has become more than a problem. It was a habit. Uh, when I ask audiences if they know better is possible, all hands go up. What about you? So there's three sentences or four sentences, and that's how I would write, is I'd use M dash, I'd use hyphens, I'd use um, sentences. I also use a little technique I actually learned from Seth Godin. Um, I emailed him once for, for a uh, testimonial on my book. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't available, but I looked at the way he responded to my email, and I noticed that he uses paragraph breaks um, to uh, hyphenate his, or sorry, as, um, as punctuation marks. So when I ask audiences if they know better as possible, all hands go up. Paragraph break, what about you? And what Seth Godin was doing there was he, instead of, um, uh, anyways, I'm not explaining this very well, but essentially what he was doing was he uses paragraph breaks to get you to read on, and it's a very effective way to also punctuate a sentence because the paragraph break basically means full stop. Okay. Uh, short paragraphs. So this is an example of a paragraph. Again, three sentences long. And what I would do is I would break it up and I'd make three sentences or th these three points in separate paragraphs. So it looks optically easier to read. Right? Uh, just jumping back here, let me grab this, uh, this. This is our list. So I talked about short sentences. I talked about short paragraphs. Remove unnecessary words. Words to watch for um, that. I was amazed when someone pointed out to me how much that shows up in my sentences, and you can almost remove every that, and the sentence still makes sense. Charlie's asking what an M dash is. Um, Charlie, you're gonna you're gonna stump me here. Um, so an M dash, E M dash, is actually twice as long as a hyphen, and there's no space between the M dash and the letters. And I, I'm not going to do a good job of explaining exactly what it's for, but an M dash, I believe, is for a continuous thought, whereas a hyphen is for two thoughts in a sentence. So you can, you can kind of look it up for me. But I use an M dash when I want to keep the reader moving, but I just want to keep the words as short as possible. So that's an M dash. Okay. Uh, simple words, you don't use fancy, complicated language. And finally, internal links simply means 
um, links between blogs, which keeps people on your site. Okay, the headline statistics I promised. This comes from um, a company called CoSchedule. Uh, the fellow's name is Garrett Moon that started this little company. It's kind of an online scheduling thing for your blogs. It's pretty neat. And he went through over a million blog posts recently. And on Noel Kagan's site, OK Dork, he did a quite uh, a, this summary. So this is the high, most highly shared headlines. And get this, these headlines were shared more than 1,000 times on social media. So that's pretty impressive. And what is it that's number one? Posts that have a list in them were shared more than any other post. So his conclusion was, if you want to write a blog post that gets shared, put a list in it. Also, he had anything with the words you and your uh, in the headlines, how-to headlines, uh, do-it-yourself DIY headlines, and finally, anything that has the words I, me, and my in the headlines. So that's an amazing resource. You can go to okdork.com and you can find that. It's like about three blogs down. You can find this, um, this little statistic. In fact, it's really worth reading the whole article on what he learned about what gets shared on the Internet with blogs. Really, really good. I mean, who else has got a million blogs that they could actually analyze? Okay, hopefully you're hanging in there. I'm going to be a couple minutes over. I apologize. Just a quick thing on images. This is how I get images from my blog site. I either use a personal photograph uh, that I have in my inventory, or I go to Flickr, which of course is um, a free website, but you have to be careful which pictures you use, and I'll show you that in a minute. Or I use Canva. Canva is a really cool online editing tool. Uh, or I use the dollarphotoclub.com. And PicMonkey is not an inventory of pictures, um, but it is a good place uh, good online tool for editing pictures. Here's how I use Flickr. I will type the word anger, for example, in the search bar. I will go over to the um, left-hand side, and I will click on Creative Commons Commercial. Um, so I know that this is a safe image. So I'm going to create, click right here where it says Creative Commons Only, and then down here it says uh, Commerce Use Allowed. I'm going to click on that, which is right away will change what's available. I grab an image. I download it. I usually download it in a large format. Then I reduce it. But before I do that, I copy the URL for that image right there. I'll show you how I use that. Then I take the image. In this case, I flipped it over. I might put the text right on it like this. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, I will copy that uh, URL for that photographer. So if someone grabbed that URL, and you should test this, it should take them directly to that picture. So that's how I reference that author. So that's how I use Flickr. Again, we'll probably do a whole webinar just on that. This is for my last my blog post that comes out in two days on my site, hughcover.com. Here's a, an image I grabbed off Flickr. Then I put a little shade on top. I add my text on top. I reference the author at the bottom. The whole thing, this whole process takes me about 20 minutes to do that. Here's uh, the previous post. I grab a kind of an ugly hotel room picture from, I think it's from Zurich actually. I put my text on top and I kind of dress it up. Here's one I did before that. Take, take a picture off Flickr. I put text on top. I reference the author and we're ready to go. Canva. This is what Canva looks like. It's free to use. Uh, you can see the, the blog post head, um, pictures that I've, I've created here. There's just there's four right there that I've created recently. It's really fast. And they have an inventory of stock photographs in there uh, that are a dollar each. Um, PicMonkey is really good for manipulating and adding text, but there's no images, there's no resource of images there. Uh, we just started using Dollar Photo Club, and uh, it's ten dollars a month, and you get ten images, and you pay a dollar for every image after that. And it's got a huge inventory of images, so it's really, really fast. It's much faster than than Flickr. Um, okay, so quick little summary. So how to be successful with blogging, number one is be consistent. Please, please, please be consistent. You're going to get more out of SOS if you consistently blog. We recommend once a week. Keep it engaging. So experiment. Try different ways. Put in lists. Use images. Images are going to help people to read your blog and to stay longer. Experiment with different topics just to see what works. 
have a call to action so that you make sure that people do something after they read the blog. You can adjust based on the Google Analytics that we are sending to you every week. So pay attention to what are the top ranking blogs. You can promote your blogs as well. So we're going to be promoting the heck out of your blogs, but you can also promote any special blogs that you have. And then please respond to people as they respond to you. Okay, there you go folks. Sorry, I'm five minutes over. I hate that. But anyways, I hope you really enjoyed this. We're going to create a special archive for this webinar so you can uh, review it. And a quick little announcement. First of all, thank you for being a part of SOS. This really is what Tim Ferriss would call a minimum viable product, but I think it's already proving that it's really uh, creating them quite amazing results. If you know of colleagues that you think would benefit from SOS, uh, please simply ask them to contact us directly so they can email me directly or they can go to hughcolver.com forward slash SOS and contact us that way. And let us know that you've passed their name on to us and we will reward you with a free month if they become a client. So just a little gift back to you. Um, so I hope you found this really useful. I hope you have an amazing long weekend. Uh, keep your heads up. Keep those blogs coming and we're going to do the best we can to get you noticed. Thanks everybody. Have a great long weekend. Take care.